dream of the fact that you have to answer to yourself and other people if you give up and don't keep going. Consistency every day wins the race. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Fairley. How do I start to try? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? The most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Show. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that little tiny bell because that's gonna give you notifications of when these things go out, meaning the three different episodes that we're dropping every single week and I appreciate your support. Now, if you're watching on YouTube as well, well, I know that the guys in the Facebook group are watching. You can actually head over to facebook.com and check out the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Facebook group request to join. And you can actually be watching these live, asking questions and getting your questions featured. Also, if you're watching the YouTube video, maybe it's a little bit later, you can actually just drop your question below and maybe we'll feature it from YouTube on the show, which I'm really, really excited about. So let's jump into some epic Q&A. So our first question, Jordan asks, what do you say to yourself when you self-talk? So I actually have heard this. It's a great question, Jordan. What do you say to yourself when you self-talk? And he's not saying, what should you say to yourself when you self-talk? He's actually asking, what do I say to myself when I self-talk? There's certain people out there that I've heard that do not self-talk, meaning they don't really like talk to themselves in the first or the third person, like, come on, Nicholas, get it. Whereas actually, you probably have heard people before that actually talk to themselves out loud. Oh man, like what the heck, dude, what are you doing? And so the, there's some people that do and some people that don't. Some people just literally don't have conversations with themselves. For me, there's multiple conversations that go on inside of my head. Some of them are self-destructive or things like self-sabotage, where I'll literally say things that if you've ever been in a situation where you mess up and you feel the pressure because you put pressure on yourself, you feel the pressure of other people because it's just a mirror of what you already believe about yourself. And so to make sure that you don't get hurt by other people, we start tearing ourselves down first. This would be like we make a mistake and we say something like, man, you're so stupid. Oh man, you suck. Man, you're terrible at this. I'm just so bad at this. What does this do? It brings down our expectations in our eyes that other people have for us. And that way that we're not falling below their expectations, they get upset. We can just get up upset, upset about ourselves. And oftentimes those people aren't even judging us. So I fall into this sometimes, just depends what I'm doing. But sometimes my self-talk even looks like, man, like you suck. Like if I mess up, I'm like, man, what the heck's so wrong? Like you suck, why are you doing that? Some of the worst ones for me is stupid little mistakes. I have a son now, 14 months. And sometimes I do things or let things happen that are just stupid where he falls or he hits his face. And I'm like, I was right there. How did I allow that to happen? And it's when there's things I cannot change or things that are outside of our control that I get frustrated or angry. And outside of that anger is where that self-destructive talk comes from because I can't change my situation. So anger is not a first emotion. It's a secondary emotion. That emotion is that I couldn't control the situation, the outcome or anything after that. I can't go back in time and change it. And so because I feel this lack of control, I got angry. And because I got angry, I started using self-destructive talk. So that's one thing that I go through. The general thing, though, of how I crush these videos, how I crush these live streams, these talks, business, et cetera, is I'm constantly talking to myself and keeping myself in a frame of mind and anchoring into myself that I'm the best. I even have a, a friend that I'm actually teaching in this community in just a few minutes. So I got to wrap up quick here that always would call me and go, Nicholas, like you got to punch yourself in the chest. I'm the best. T tell me your power word. What's the thing that you're going to say that gets you back in the state? And so ultimately for me, it's consistently encouraging myself, like you're the best, you're the best, you've got this. Like consistently getting myself in the mode of belief because what I found through my favorite sport, motocross, it's a weird sport. You got the top 20 riders in the entire world in motocross, but the top three to five people are extremely better than the last 15. And you have these guys that get 15th place, 18th place, 12th place for years. And then there's one night where they go out there and somehow they do better. They get third place, they get their first podium finish. For some reason, if they just continue with that momentum, that newfound belief, no more talent, you can't get better in a day, no matter what it is, can't get better. Not gonna get that much better in a day. 
They go out there and all of a sudden they continually get fifth, fourth, third, first. Even people have gone on to win championships because of experiencing a newfound belief. They got a different result that created new confidence. And out of that confidence, not new tactics, not new ability, they absolutely change their situation. So what I found from that is that though some sports are very much so about the talent of the person, oftentimes anyone at the top, they're talented. They just do not have the self-belief and the confidence. And a lot of times they wait for something good to happen to get that confidence and that day may never come. Then there's other people out there that they have the confidence even when they're not seeing the results. And out of that confidence, they get those same exact results. No matter which way we look at it, the big thing that we see is that someone who is a 15th, 20 place guy in life, not getting paid much, after one good result, changes his entire situation just based on his belief. So my self-talk is very, I would say that I don't sit there and talk to myself very often. I'm a person that sits there and thinks about situations and thinks about all these other things that are going on. I'm not sitting there going, Nicholas, how are you today? How are you feeling today? You, you got this, man. But I'm consistently in my head anchoring myself to a state of being of where I felt powerful in the past or where I felt powerful thinking about myself in the future. And a lot of times it just comes down to simple little things like you've got this. You've got this. You've got this. I remember I had those charm bracelets that you can stamp on your uh, on your hand, and mine said value, just value, value, valuable. My 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 goal was, man, I just want to be the most valuable person on the planet. When I die, I wanted to have a stamp on my gravestone that just said, the most valuable man that ever lived. He just gave so much to people, and it was a tone. It was a thought of life. I was like, man, like valuable. You're valuable. You're valuable. You're valuable. Because inside of that lens of that type of self talk comes a plethora of actions. I actually have some trainings in the BDB vault inside of our BDB club. If you guys are not in the BDB club, you can head to the billiondollarbody.com slash brotherhood. And inside of there, I actually have a training on the three different phases of what I believe in consumption. So self-talk would be reflection. So you have ingest. So what are you putting into yourself? This is books, videos, these trainings, et cetera. Whatever you surround yourself with, Whatever you feed yourself with is what's going to nourish your body, right? So whatever is going in, what's going in from the outside, that can be people that you're surrounded with. Ingesting. Number two is digesting. This is self-talk, dialogue. What are you thinking about? What are you contemplating? This is something that you can still control, and that'll ultimately dictate what you express. So ingest, digest, express is the formula, and if you can actually take control and dictate what's going in, what your thought life's like, and that'll actually end up dictating your actions because those things will align or else you'll feel conflicting in the brain. And if you're trying to be confident, but internally you don't feel confident, well, we can always look at those three phases and feel, how can I stack these to get them to line up? You may be asking, okay, how do I change my self-talk then? One of the first things to know is a thought isn't a belief. A thought is just a thought. Oftentimes what happens is you have a thought and once it's thought about long enough, it turns into uh, an emotion and then it turns into a feeling and then it turns into a belief and then it reinforces the thought. And then we take that thought and the feeling and the emotion and we create a belief around it and then we start having this newfound thing about this is who I am. So what we can do is we can actually capture things in the thought phase, replace it with a new thought that creates a new emotion, that creates a, a new feeling and then creates a new belief. And so if you were to drive past a bridge and you say, oh, man, I want to jump off this bridge. You may think, am I suicidal? No, you're not suicidal. You had a suicidal thought, but you in yourself are not suicidal. Until we contemplate that, we start beating ourselves up. How would I think that way? It creates an emotion of negativity and we start thinking, man, I feel suicidal. And then it creates a belief. And we can actually capture that and take every thought captive and be transformed by renewing our mind. So give it a shot. Thank you, Jordan, for the epic question. We'll take question number two. What's question number two? Nathan, I appreciate it, man. I actually just threw it up on the board. He said, what's up, man? Question, best way to sell digital products that you have created? Uh, this is a great question. Digital product. So first off, let's define digital product. This is something that's not a physical good. It's a digital good, which means that it's downloadable. It's something that you consume. You're logging to a membership site. The biggest thing is knowing what type of digital product is it, right? So uh, for me, I'm only really good at selling things that are higher ticket, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands. I Meaning that I could sell $7. I mean, I've sold 
hundreds and hundreds or thousands of books, however many it is, that's a very small ticket thing, right? And it, there's the audio version, it's a digital version. Each one of those things that will have a different strategy based on the price point, because it is a lot different of a process to sell a $20 book compared to a $20,000 coaching program. So the process and the steps that I'll take to be able to do that is going to be different. So is it a $7 membership site? Is it a $5 membership site? Is it a $30 membership site? Is it a $1,000 a month product? What is the actual product? Is it a course? So generally, I look at things in, in three different areas for most different digital product sellers. Digital products could be something like, all right, is this a, a, a done for you service? Like a D, done for you is like the most expensive style, which probably wouldn't be a digital product because that'd be more of a service. Done with you, which is more of like a coaching program. And then you have things that are, DIY, which would be more fitting into this digital product space of a course or an ebook or something of that nature. So th some of the best ways right now, and again, some of this isn't my area of expertise unless it's over a thousand, two thousand dollars. The th the way that I'm seeing is the best way right now from some of my friends like Russell Brunson and Peng Jun, etc. And realize that I'm not saying, hey guys, here's the answer. If if I've done it before, and in some areas right here, I will tell you what I have done. I will tell you, this is what I've done. Here's the answer. If I have not done it, I will not just sit here and say, hey, here's the answer. I will say, here's what I'm seeing from the best people in the world because I invest in the best people to learn from them and I'm great friends with them. So what I've seen right now that's working really, really well is doing five-day challenges. Number one, you can check out Pedro Odeo, great friend of mine. Number two, webinars, live and evergreen for sure. Outside of that, virtual events virtual events and the best thing is you can actually use the five day challenges. We talked about this a little bit in the in depth on the last Q and a session. You can use the five day challenges. You can do the, use the webinars live or, or evergreen to actually sell the tickets for the virtual event. Cause ultimately like if you're trying to sell a, a lower price product, you probably do that through the five day challenge or you probably do it through the webinar. From there, if, if it's not something over a thousand, two thousand dollars, I wouldn't be selling it over the phone. I wouldn't be doing it through applications. Now, if it is, then it may be worth doing the applications. From there, you can now hold the digital or virtual event. These virtual events can be anywhere between one day, a workshop, and two days. Typically, inside of that virtual event, day number one, I wouldn't do the pitch. Day number two, either right before or right after lunch, I would open up cart. I would generally do it to an application, to a phone call, or to a small deposit to a phone call. So deposit to lock in their spot. This would be like a $500 deposit. Then they would get on the phone with someone that would work out payment with them. And that at least locks them in at something that they could say, hey, for $500, I can get started today. That's the way that you do it. It's one of the best ways right now to sell digital products that you've created. Again, that's based on not knowing the actual investment of the digital product or who it's for or what it's selling or who you're selling to, et cetera, because those are going to change different things, right? If it's a digital product that's how to fix my electric wheelchair or my seat that goes up and down the thing, like, you know, on the stairs, that is a different demographic than someone that's trying to start a digital marketing agency that's 20 years old. So take that with a grain of salt. And man, I appreciate the question. All right. Question number three. Yo, Gary, I appreciate the question, man. Uh, Gary's question is regarding interviews slash podcast style content. Where do you start? I'm wanting to do interviews in an extremely niche market. I'm looking to get started doing interviews in the reptile industry, specifically for uh, ball pythons, looking into clubhouse start. Also, that's so crazy. Ch connect with Andrew Hall as well. Andrew Hall's wife like does all these crazy things with reptiles, which is kind of weird that, that you just even talked about that. So uh, regarding interviews, podcast style content, where do you start? Where you, where you start really is actually just figuring out what do you actually want the show to do? Who do you want it to serve? And then from there, actually starting to do the interviews. So yeah, there's the technical side inside of the BDB club. And if you just reach out to me, I actually have a podcast checklist that's literally like, here's like a mic that you get. Here's the things that you want to have. Here's the software that you want to have. The simple logical stuff of just setting up the show. Inside of our podcast agency, we actually do this for free for people. They hire us to do the post-production. We give them all the advice on how to launch the podcast 100% free. We don't charge people on how to launch podcasts because our goal is that if they launch it and they do great, they're going to want someone to take over all the editing. So number one is literally just getting the simple stuff, the foundation laid, getting the software, getting yourself approved. Yet yeah, I would not try to get approved on iTunes or Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, whatever, 
until you actually already have a few interviews in the bank. Because generally in our podcast launch strategy that we teach our clients, you want to launch with eight episodes minimum in the bank. You want to drop one episode right off the bat and generally two more episodes in a row each day after and then going into your normal format. Your normal format, you want to make sure that you can commit to for a very long time. So if you do interviews on Tuesdays, continue to do interviews on Tuesdays. Oftentimes, people either commit to too little or too much. They do one and they're like, man, I wish I could do more interviews. Or they do three interviews a week like I started out doing. And it was like, oh my gosh, why are we doing so many interviews? This is freaking insane. And then what happens is that people get so used to consuming your content it's kind of like a TV show. All of a sudden, the episode doesn't come out the right day. And they're like, um, hello, why is the episode not coming out at the right time? Like, well, what's going on? Like, imagine trying to watch your favorite TV show and the show just doesn't come out. It does not work that way. So you want to be consistent right off the bat, which is why you want to have a few interviews in the bank when you get started. And then the biggest thing is to start actually recording the episodes in that way that you could start getting becoming a better interviewer. You can't become a better interviewer without actually doing the episodes. The only thing that you can do is study great interviewers so that when you're actually trying to get better, you're practicing great actual tactics in the process. So you just wanna do interviews in an extremely niche market, looking to get started doing interviews in the reptile industry. Yeah, so what, one of the things that I would do is, the cool thing about a show and a podcast is nobody really knows how to track the metrics, right? Like they can look at how many followers on Instagram you have or how many Facebook likes that you have or whatever. Inside of a podcast, it's really difficult to see. All you can really see is maybe reviews or response. So with that, following like our podcast launch strategy that we teach inside the B2B club, you can legitimately get 100 five-star reviews in the first 30 days. So imagine this, that you follow the podcast checklist, you then do your interviews and lay the foundation, and then you launch with the podcast launch strategy, you get 100 plus five-star reviews in the first 30 days. And now you can go after these huge people that would be influencers in the small niche that you're looking to, to um, really incorporate yourself into. Inside of the vault as well, we actually have Ryan Mickler that talks about a concept of, he does C player interviews, B player, and then A player. So meaning that if you get huge interview guests, like the best ones in the industry, you don't drop them three in a row. What you do is you rotate things like people that people have never heard and they get the benefit coming on your show. That'd be a C player. A B player, it's a mutual benefit, right? Similar size audience. They bring a lot of value and they're bringing listeners. And oftentimes the B player will be the ones that promote the most because they're not the biggest names on the planet, yet they understand that your show's bringing them value as well. And then you have A players, which would be getting like the, the people from Animal Planet to come on and, and do a big show with you. They may not promote that show, yet it's the thing that attracts people in and keeps the retention of with clients. So you want to rotate C players, B players, A players into the lineup. And so imagine having that and being able to reach out to these big guests and then saying yes, because they're saying who else has a reptile show with 100 plus reviews that just launched. This must be a great platform for me. And you'll find that it's way easier to get these people than normal. You can actually just go over to Instagram lots of times, start hitting them up in the DMs, giving to them, seeing if you could support their vision. And ultimately, you can get one-to-one -one conversations in Instagram DMs. That's the way that you're going to want to start it. And just making sure that, hey, is this contributing to the end vision in mind? Because a podcast is not just a hobby unless that's what you want it to be. It's supposed to support the business that you're growing. It's a way to nurture your current audience. And it's a way to get a new audience. So focus on serving those people. All right, cool. This last question, and I have to do it really quickly. What keeps you going in times of self-doubt, confusion, and lack of mental clarity? Man, it's a really good question. And I would say that a few different things keep me going. The community around me holding me to the standard. God holding me to a standard. Knowing that I have to answer to the community around me, myself, God, knowing that I gave up and left potential on the side. So there's the potential that I have, which just pisses me off if I do not hit it. And then there's the other side of failing in front of all these people sounds so terrible because I myself am not a failure and it's a bad representation of the identity that I have. And I am just so fearful of misrepresenting my God, my identity, and who I am to my friends and family that I will not allow that to happen. And so it's in those times that that fear comes out. 
and that fear gets me to run away from the end conclusion. It gets me to perform at a higher level than ever before. All right, if you want to run 50 miles, having a goal at the end of the day may not be, get you to run your fastest 50 miler. But if I put a bear behind you that chases you for 50 miles, you best believe you're going to run your ass off. Doesn't mean that it's healthy, yet it is a true motivation. And that's one of the big things is when I'm lacking the mental clarity, I'm having confusion or self-doubt, I, I anchor myself to like, what am I going to do? What's the outcome? I, I humble myself in that reality, accept that reality, and start looking at the facts, the figures, the truth. What is the truth about me? What have I done in the past? When was the last time I felt confident? And knowing that I'm more powerful, smarter than I've ever been before in my life. I was dumber a year ago. If you felt confident when you were dumber, that is just stupid. So you're in the best place you've ever been in your life. Anchor yourself back to those moments. Capture that fear and use it as motivation. And also dream of the fact that you have to answer to yourself and other people if you give up and don't keep going. Consistency every day wins the race. Thank you guys for tuning in to Q&A. And if you jump into the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Facebook group next week, we're going to be doing the same exact thing, Q&A, open coaching. Appreciate you guys, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Make sure to check it out on YouTube. Subscribe, hit the little bell. You'll get notifications when it goes live, and you'll see when you get featured. Peace out. Thanks again.